Welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Hi, I'm John Molesky. Our guests today are Landon Van Dyke, Senior Advisor for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability at the United States Department of State, and Ann Bowser, Director of Innovation with the Wilson Center's Science and Technology Innovation Program. They join us to discuss a program called Earth Challenge 2020 and its implications for citizen science. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, John. Let me uh, do a, you know, we, we also taped uh, an additional episode of On Earth Challenge 2020 with some of your colleagues involved in the project. But for the benefit of viewers who, who haven't seen that yet, and of course you will watch it, uh, could you recap what Earth Challenge 2020 is? Sure, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day is on April 22nd, 2020. And we are using this milestone, along with our partners at the State Department and the Earth Day Network, to help reimagine the environmental movement as more participatory. And the ultimate goal is to launch the world's biggest coordinated citizen science campaign to date, uh, ultimately engaging millions of people in collecting one billion observations in air quality, water quality, biodiversity, pollution, and human health. So that's all, a small little project globally, the largest ever of its kind conducted. Uh, Van de, or Landon, uh, tell me about the State Department's interest in this project. How does this fit into the overall mission? Well, as most of your viewers probably know, the State Department, our mission is to share the American story, to promote um, policy, uh, security, economics, but it's also to share the story. And you know, when you talk about the environmental movement, especially in the 70s, it originated in the United States. And mm -hmm. so for us, uh, sharing what environmentalism is and its values for the country overseas makes sense. And so we're looking at this project as a way to, um, again, reimagine and, and engage uh, the world community on environmentalism. What are some of the other activities that the, the State Department is engaged in around environment? You hear this term, eco-diplomacy. Could you tell us what that's all about? Oh, eco-diplomacy is about sharing or using diplomacy as a, a platform or environmentalism as a platform for diplomacy. So we engage other countries on um, air quality, water quality. Um, we use a lot of these technologies for ourselves, for our embassies. So one of my primary missions at the State Department is to make the embassies environmentally friendly, um, reduce their environmental footprint, um, but then also share with the, the local community in the, in the countries how we do it and um, either pick up best practices from those countries, but then also um, share information about U.S. technology and um, uh, businesses that are able to provide those solutions. And one of the interesting components of the project is that people out there, citizen scientists, self-appointed citizen scientists, will help define what the parameters are of what you're going to be looking at. And those questions are already coming in for, for judgment. Will, will there be a, a jury that will decide which will make the cut? Well, it's starting off as a crowdsourcing project in its own. So we asked every member of the public to tell us what the biggest areas of environmental concern are. And we've gotten submissions via Twitter, via websites, and via the Chinese platform WeChat from each of these seven continents, including Antarctica. So that's an update from your last NOW segment. And after we get these, we're going to work with a, a partner to do some qualitative data analysis and identify the top buckets. And then we'll convene an expert panel to do a feasibility analysis and figure out where we can have the most value to add in terms of what the public cares about in terms of what scientists care about, in terms of what partners working with Earth observations and complementary types of information need. And then we'll identify the research questions from that process. How, are you familiar enough with what's come in already to identify any emerging themes? Unsurprisingly, climate is probably number one. I was delighted to see some questions on the social science of climate research and climate literacy, sort of what makes that stick. How, how does the State Department ap approach climate? Because you live in a political environment. We're mm -hmm. still in this country. That, that becomes somewhat controversial, even though among scientists or perhaps even globally, not so much. Mm -hmm. Well, we focus a lot on the immediate environmental um, impacts. So things like air, air quality, water quality, energy, um, conservation of energy. And so we look at resources and conservation of that. And then we look at the solutions that we can deploy today. And you know, it's, it's been more of a pragmatic approach, just mm -hmm. saying, hey, if there's ways that we can reduce our energy footprint, let's do that. It's uh, good for the environment, but it's also good for the economy. It's also good for our business. Um, and it does have climate implications as well. So we look at more of a holistic 
what can we do for the environment? And um, there'll be benefits for pollution, there'll be benefits for climate, there'll be benefits for uh, scarcity and resources if we just focus on what uh, technologies and solutions we can deploy today. So well, that's what we focus on. Thanks. Well, when will the first activities take place beyond the collection stage? I would say that the first activities are already happening through the crowdsourcing call for research questions and through the community mobilization. This is a mobilization project as much if not more than a data collection one. So starting to plant ideas within communities, um, starting to re recruit partners from the sensor community and so on and so forth to think about how they can come together and build something that's greater than any of their That's the part offers. that I was asking about, that build something that's greater. What happens when you identify the partners, when you have people engaged, when you have the final list of questions for exploration, then what? Yeah, that's the magic, John. So our challenge is kind of facilitating that collaboration by developing different pieces of infrastructure. So a platform for communities to sign up to participate in Earth Challenge. When I say communities, I mean existing citizen science projects, but also schools, educators, people who want to be involved but haven't quite found that sweet spot yet mm -hmm. so that they can mm -hmm. shape the actual activities from the ground up and then also work with their individual community members to become volunteers. Could you provide an example of a type of activity that might emerge just so we can get past sort of the general description and start thinking about exactly what this might look like? Sure, so I love biodiversity, and there is an excellent database of biodiversity observations called GBIF, and about 40% of those are coming from citizen science. But when I say biodiversity, it's actually only whether a species is present in a particular area. But you can actually do a lot more with a data point on a species than just that. So for Earth Challenge, we might run uh, a project kind of adding additional metadata tags to those species observations. So if you have a picture of a tree and then another picture of a tree, you can kind of tag that in a way that that becomes plant phenology information, which is used to solve immediate problems, but also help scientists understand longer term issues like climate change. Why is citizen science a growth industry? I think it's the accessibility of the technology. Um, prior to uh, cloud computing, smaller sensors, smartphones, you know, a lot of the computing was done in labs and companies and organizations that had way more money uh, to throw at something. Whereas today, my grandmother and her neighborhood can go around and uh, take photos of pollinators and be part of that, that movement and be part of uh, the gathering of that data set, where prior to that we could not. And how valuable is that data? Is it, do, is the, does the scientific community as a whole, can we generalize, have they embraced the concept of citizen science? Yeah, it's growing. Uh, data is the new oil, and small data, like data, observational data collected through citizen science and on the ground campaigns, is really critical for advancing research on any scale, but especially for validating information from other sources like Earth observations, and for doing things like training uh, machine learning algorithms as well. Yeah. When I was first introduced to citizen science in discussions from colleagues here at the Wilson Center, it was it was about more immediate things like gathering data when there was an earthquake from areas closer to the epicenter. It sounds as if it's become way more sophisticated. Well, with the advent of AI and machine learning and being able to take data that normally you could only use immediately because you couldn't sift through it all, uh, you were looking for something very specific. Now, because we have machine learning, you can sift through all of it and have the machine identify patterns which otherwise you normally would not have looked for. Um, so you, you didn't have time. So, so. so then what happens once, when all this data is available and this, this uh, growing body of work is, is accumulated? Does this project have legs? This isn't just about a 50th anniversary. You see this as an ongoing project where the data will grow and grow and grow, both in quantity and in usefulness. We do. I think of it as research infrastructure. So if you build a library, you want to start collecting books. And these are the data points that uh, address very specific, very local problems. But you're also designing and curating uh, a larger warehouse. And you'll build different components of it as you understand how people are actually using the library as a research infrastructure. So we want to use a co-design approach to work with the citizen science community and other stakeholders to help evolve this project over time. Who owns the database? Uh, it's a community property. It's going to be completely open source. 
and different people will be able to assign different IP to their individual observations, for example, indicating whether or not they want attribution, but we, can, we see this as a community property. Mm -hmm. This word innovation, part of your, your title, you know, it's a jargony word for, for people within an industry, they kind of know what they mean by it, but help us translate that for people who are watching and how, in the context of Earth Challenge 2020, what are we talking about? What is innovation? Is the project itself innovative or do you expect innovation to emerge from the project? Both. I mean, uh, for the, the software development kit, you know, so there are standards that we're trying to establish for uh, the earth science community and for the citizen science community at large. Um, where there's, up to this point, there may have been some challenges on trying to figure out what those standards would be. We're hoping that through this process and crowdsourcing, we'll be able to establish at least the beginning of those standards and then be able to integrate them into things like a, a software development kit. Mm -hmm. So if, let's say, again, my grandmother was to have her grandson put together a... Is your a, grandmother a citizen scientist? Is she? Uh, she, better, <laughs> she, she better be. It's me. You're recruiting her. Yeah, exactly. Um, if she is um, having someone put a, uh, an app together mm -hmm. to have her start gathering this data, uh, you, you probably don't have everybody to understand. They, they probably don't know all the standards that are out there. So within the kit itself, we'll embed those standards. And so the innovation is being able to standardize data sets and be able to allow different science communities to start linking data together through putting that infrastructure in place, which is what Anne's getting at. So does the director of innovation have any more to add on this notion of how we think about innovation in the context of Earth Challenge 2020? What we're trying to do is enable and encourage people to do that thing that they have wanted to do but haven't found a reason to mm -hmm. in celebration of the 50th anniversary. So Create I think a context that's for them exactly. Too. And then, I mean, really what you're talking about here has long-term implications. This project, if it succeeds, can outlive us all. Hope yes. so. Yes, so well, you know, what we want is, uh, you know, so we were talking about Paris the other day and talking about how countries can contribute to that. And in many cases, you have developing countries which may or may not have the resources to contribute either through metrics or observations. By enabling uh, this tool for their citizens, they now have an additional tool that they can use to start um, doing better observations and metrics for their, uh, their country and their people and is, is by it, engaging their people. I'm sorry, forgive me no, for no, stepping no. on your, your word on that. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you're, you really think is important for people to understand about this project? Hackathons? Oh yeah, I forgot, all about, I forgot all about More innovation right there. Building on yeah. the Wilson Center is a successful science hack day, but Landon can tell you more about that. Well, we're just going to have multiple hackathons around the world uh, that will take advantage of the SDK and the platform that we're putting together. So that I know we, we all, you've hosted them in the past here at the Wilson Center. W mm -hmm. Will we be hosting any at the State Department? I hope so. So uh, and hopefully at, at some of the embassies or at least uh -huh. uh, um, in, in support with the embassies around the world. So, Are there indications that any particular countries are most engaged in a project like this? Great question. Um, so there are a practitioner network, citizen science associations that have been established in the United States, in Europe, and in Australia. And we're seeing networks emerge uh, in Asia and in Africa as well. So again, going back to use this to do whatever it was that you want to do, we're hoping to help encourage the geographic spread by sort of raising a profile of citizen science mm -hmm. around the world. So I, I ask uh, your, your colleagues who were on a, a previous episode of Now and talking about the project, uh, it, what are their greatest hopes for the project? And I want to give you both the opportunity to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Is there, w when, you, when you look ahead, and you kind of in, envision what success looks like, what do you think about? I think ultimately it's the infrastructure. Hopefully we'll have a tool that uh, the rest of the world will be able to use beyond Earth Day 2020. Um, for me, I look at it also as an opportunity to bring Earth Day um, back into a community um, element where uh, the first Earth Day was successful because everybody was on the street, they could see each other, they understood that they were in a movement and they were together and they knew what the purpose was. Um, because Earth Day is so large now and it's, it's celebrated by so many people around the world, you don't always feel that community. It might be there, but someone in New Zealand might be doing tree planting and someone in Maryland might be doing tree planting 
and they might not feel that they're connected and doing something in concert with each other. Mm -hmm. um, being able to uh, collect data on the day of Earth Day or the month of Earth Day um, and be able to sit there with my niece and go, hey, we're going to learn a little bit about air quality and why it's important. And then we're going to open up this app and we're going to do our bit to collect a little piece of data. And that data will be part of this huge data stream and then be able to show her on a map of all the other data points that have been collected. It will help her understand where her piece is in the whole thing, but then also it'll allow us to feel a little more connected to all of the other people that are yeah. contributing and, and, and feel that the environment is important to them. Power of connecting the dots. Yeah. And how about you? Yeah, connecting those dots on different levels. I'm, um, I'm excited about watching the citizen science community grow over the next few years. And what makes me happy about this project is the unknown unknown. So we already know that there's a ton of citizen science being done for the environment. And I suppose Earth Day is inherently environmental, but I would love to see some projects around energy, around food security, which has some environmental aspects, but is also much greater than that, and sort of watching this expand beyond Earth systems research to kind of encompass, for example, all of the sustainable development goals. So you're at the, really at the precipice of uh, the very beginning of this movement. The potential is hard to even imagine. It's accelerating, for sure. Yeah. Uh, w well, before we close, for people who want more information or want to get directly involved, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, earthchallenge.org, right? Yes, come to the website. Come to the mm -hmm. website. Okay. There you go, you have it. And uh, we, we will put that on the bottom of the screen for you as well to help you out, except that won't help those of you who are listening via the podcast. But uh, earthchallenge.org, there it is. So yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations you, on launching this exciting project. Thank you. Thank you, John.